Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. He's a TEDx speaker and author of some of the most popular books on product, agile, and coaching, including Product Mastery. He's also the founder of Agile Mastery Institute, with the mission of offering meaningful long-term support and development for professionals instead of two-day two certifications. Delighted to welcome Jeff Watts. I've been told I need to, hi, I've been told I need to get better at this Instagram thing. So I, I want to get a little video of you guys. This is in person and the cameras. So just wave, that's all. Hi. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, first, first thing, I want to say thank you to, to David and Alice and all the team, and well done, because I know how hard it is or how hard it was to organize a conference, and now it's even harder. So I'm going to give them a round of applause for putting this on. Cool, yeah, so thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Jeff. I'm here to talk to you about mastering your inner demons as product people. Um, you know there's a lot of stuff for you to do. There's a lot of things you need to master. Roadmaps, visions, personas, customers, users, development teams, all these different things you need to master. Um, but one thing that often gets forgotten is you. Uh, so I'm here to try and shift your focus back onto you a little bit um, and to tell you that it's not selfish, that it is actually a good business decision to focus on you a little bit. That's my plan. Um, and I want to start off with a little bit of a, of a story. Have, just out of it, have we, I, maybe we have, I don't know. Have we got any Australians in the room today? No? Oh, never mind. I was going to... I was going to ask if you, if you knew, knew this person. If you're not from Australia, the chances are you don't know this person. His name's Cliff. Cliff Young. And he, if he's not a national hero, he should be. Um, he's kind of a hero to me, even though I'm not Australian. He was a farmer in Australia. Has anybody heard of Cliff Young? Two people. Okay, cool. So um, Cliff was a farmer, spent a lot of time in his fields, and back, uh, back in the 80s, I think it was early 80s, 1981, I think, he decided that he would enter an ultra marathon, which went from Sydney all the way to Melbourne. 544 miles. I don't like running 5K, let alone 544 miles. And this was a farmer, okay? Not, a, not an athlete. And he was asked why he's entering this crazy, crazy race. And he said, well, I spend a lot of time in the fields chasing after sheep. I won't do the accent. Uh, chasing after sheep and pulling out potatoes. I reckon I've got enough stamina to do this. And he was famous for training and running in what he called his gum boots, what I would call Wellington boots. And this was, this was quite a... Quite a challenge. Now, obviously, I'm telling you this story because there's a, there's a happy ending here, right? Obviously. Uh, he did win. Uh, what was interesting about it was he defied conventional wisdom. So conventional wisdom at the time for these high-performance high athletes was the 18-6 rule. So you'd run for 18 hours, and then you'd sleep for six, and then you'd run for 18 hours, and you'd sleep for six. Uh, Cliff was having none of that. So I don't need to sleep. I'll just keep on going. So I won't do the accent. Um, he he ran well. Ran, run ran not particularly the right word. He, he, it became known as the cliff shuffle. Basically, he just shuffled continuously, and it's a classic tortoise and hare story. While these professional athletes in their Adidas and Nike trainers were sleeping for six hours, he just kept on shuffling, and he won. And they built this memorial of his gum boots to celebrate, and he became a bit of a of a news story. And you're sitting there thinking, all right, Jeff, why are, you, uh, why are you talking to us about this Australian farmer, this, this person who took on a, a seemingly impossible role that involved not a lot of sleep, um, with amateurish training, with poor equipment, 
very little support team. That's nothing to do with product people. We're professionals. We have all the support and the training and the tools and the equipment we need. We have plenty of sleep. We don't keep going for days on end. We don't have to do the impossible. So that's good news. I don't have to talk to you about this, uh, this, this challenge, this stress. You are happy, stress-free, delighting your customers, working harmoniously with your development teams and sales and marketing. Everything's going at a sustainable pace, nice and predictable. So, um, yeah, absolutely no relevance for you at all. I can tell from some of the smiles on the faces that maybe there's something in there. So, uh, is it an impossible job? I get, I get told a lot there's not enough hours in the day. Um, if only our users would do what they were supposed to do, it would be fine. Um, this development team, they're so slow. Can't they speed up? Why are sales selling this? Can't do that yet. Um, it's, it's a challenge. I, you have my empathy. You have my sympathy. I am a product owner, and I have to bite my tongue now and again. I have to try and swallow my own medicine. Um, and it's, it's tough. Now, I would be interested to know, just as a, as a show of hands, I'm, I'm not, not amazing at this hybrid thing, so I haven't figured out how to, uh, how to get a show of hands online at the same time. But just as a quick show of hands, who, who here would say your biggest stressor is your customers not many what about your users your sfus stupid users no what about other product people would you say they were your biggest stresses leadership you okay all right sales few people dev team legacy code Okay, bit of a spread. What if I were to tell you that actually the biggest people to blame for the problems that you have are your parents? <laughs> this is my position for the day. We'll, we'll explore this a little bit with a little bit of fun, but a little bit of seriousness as well. You see... I would suggest that most of those stresses that you have from those other parties are just external manifestations of things that you have written into your life script, courtesy of your very loving family, well-intentioned family. I will position to you that every parent, no matter how well-intentioned, screws up their kids. Okay? It's just a question of how they screw them up and how much they screw them up and in what direction. Okay, myself included. It's become a bit of a tradition now for me to put a picture of my family at some point in one of my talks in Ireland. So this is, this is my brood. These are the people that I've spent the last 20 years screwing up. Not deliberately. Okay, I try my best. But uh, I have my own issues. And somehow, somehow I managed to screw these wonderful people up. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we might be able to do uh, to, to help you avoid... Burnout, okay. a lot of product owners I coach, a lot of product managers I coach, really suffer from burnout. They suffer from stress. Some of them get into a point where they think, do you know what, why am I doing this? I could just go and work in a bar. It's so much easier. Right. I want to help you with that. I'm going to give you a tool or a, or, a, or a model to help you with that. It's actually a psychoanalytical tool called transactional analysis. I won't be able to do it anywhere near the amount of justice that it is due. I'm only going to be scratching the surface of it. But don't worry, I have no couches up here. Okay? I am not a practicing therapist. I'm not going to get you talking about your daddy issues or your Oedipus complex or anything like that. I'm just going to be talking about some of the stuff that's going on for us now that might, might if you're aware of it, uh, and how you might be able to deal with it and, and bring it back into balance, might help you as a product owner, master yourself. Because ultimately, the only person you can really control and influence is the person you see in the mirror every morning. So transactional analysis, um, the transactions are effectively communication exchanges. So this, this model talks about the communication exchanges between people and also between states of people. So this talks about us having three different states. There's a part of us that is a parent, an adult, and a child. 
And those different states communicate within each other inside our heads. And we try and communicate with other people. Those are the transactions. And they're not always, they're not always seamless, shall we say. And they're influenced. So if we can help uh, understand what states involve for us and for other people, we can start building more awareness of our interactions. We can become more self-aware. We can manage ourselves better. And as a result, if we can manage ourselves better, we can start working with other people in a better way, build better products. We can become more self-regulating. Um, and this is all based on this, this, this concept of a life script. Okay, don't go too deep on this one. But a life script, as they define it, is the, the culmination of dysfunctional behaviours from self-limiting decisions we make in childhood uh, and we carry over into our adulthood. They're made with good intentions. And it, it, can, it can be something as simple as uh, either an explicit or subliminal message from, from people of authority saying things like, hey, you've got to be lucky to be successful or you've got to work hard to be successful. These types of messages that sort of get ingrained in us and, and we don't even realise how we act on them. So like I said, I will, I will re-emphasise, it's not a therapy session. All right. All models are wrong. Even the model that I'm going to give you today is wrong. Doesn't mean it can't be useful though. So take from it whatever is useful and leave the rest behind. Okay. Don't go too far in it. Just look at, well, maybe there's something I can learn about myself here. And if that would be useful to me as a product owner, brilliant, I will grab it. All right. So there are five transactional analysis drivers, these things that have, we have learnt in our younger years as our definitions of success, of goodness, of how we are going to, um, how we should act and what we should value. And most people will relate to a couple of them quite strongly. You might notice a little bit of all five of them in you. Uh, that's fine. Don't get worried about labelling yourself or anything like that, but just take it with that pinch of salt. So the first one, hurry up. Okay. You're quite an impatient person. We'll talk more about these in detail as we go through, but just as, a, as an introduction, we've got uh, please me. You know, remember someone saying, do this, I'm happy. I'll be happy if you do this. I'll be disappointed if you don't do this. Uh, there's the be perfect driver. There's the be strong driver. Push on through. And then there's the try hard driver. All right, some of you might even, be, even before I go into detail, think, oh, yeah, 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 all right, that's me, that's me. Again, don't judge yourself on it. Just be interested in it. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just interesting. So, hurry up, driver. If you find yourself talking quite slowly, sorry, talking quite quickly, I need to slow down, otherwise, I'll make mistakes. So it's talking very quickly. You want to get to the point really quickly. You want other people to get to the point really, really quickly. If you notice that, could be you've got a hurry-up driver going on. If you're tapping your foot, if you're tapping your fingers on the table, if you're pacing around the room while you're talking, maybe you've got a bit of a hurry-up driver going on. If you've got nothing going on, if you're just sitting there, you think, okay, calm, and calm stresses you. Something should be happening. You might have a hurry-up driver going on. Okay, again, not good, not bad, just interesting. If you find quiet, if you find silence, if you find peace, stressful, uh, constantly checking your watch, you don't like to be late, uh, you don't like it when other people are late. Actually, multitasking is a symptom of a hurry up driver because if we've got something that's blocked, rather than wait there, we'll start something else so that we can make progress because we might be running out of time. Not good, not bad, just interesting. Find yourself rushing from meeting to meeting. The idea of being late is very stressful. You'll leave a meeting early to avoid, um, to avoid being late to the next one. You might leave the football early, miss the last couple of goals just so you get to the car park because you don't want to get stuck in traffic, these couple of things. My wife, bless her, on her iPhone has probably got about 60 different alarms set for different things during the day. Constantly in fear of missing something, of being late for something. Alarm, alarm, alarm. The kids' teas are on it now. But why is that relevant to you as a product owner? Well, if you've got a hurry-up driver, there are some advantages to it, right? Definitely some advantages to it. We actually talk about releasing early, don't we? We talk about getting something out quickly. We want to rush. We don't want to take our time because if we take too much time, our competition will beat us to it. The idea might become obsolete. But... 
we can find ourselves releasing too early. You've probably heard of procrastination. Me, personally, I'm more of a procrastinator. All right? I tend to make decisions too quickly rather than sit on them and think of them. And that sometimes is a good thing, but sometimes means that I make a suboptimal decision. Sometimes I make a decision that doesn't actually need to be made at all. Just because I don't like having that thing hanging over my head. I hate having an inbox with 10 things. In it. I'd rather have inbox zero. If I just reply to it, the ball is now in their court. Right? So, but I will often reply too quickly. Uh, I can get burnout, but I've been like this for 40 odd years. So I'm kind of used to it. I kind of got to a sustainable pace. But actually, the people who work with me, they might not have the same coping structures. They might not have the same resilience. They might not have the same ability to keep up with, with my pace expectations of them. And depending on our relationship, I could easily, without even realizing it, encourage other people to burn out, not just myself. So there's, there's those things to bear in mind. Equally, if I'm looking through data, I don't tend to go very deep if I've got this hurry-up driver. I will see something, I think, okay, yep, I like that, let's go with that. Rather than look at the, whether it's actually the, uh, there's actually causation there, I'll go with the correlation. Uh, I'll just see the surface level stuff and make some decisions on it, because then we can make some progress. So I need someone in my team who is a lot more data-orientated, who's a lot slower, who processes information properly, who can make sure that I don't go off on a, on a very quick knee-jerk tangent and because I'm multitasking, because I've got lots of things going on, I don't like quiet, I've often got work in progress, which, as you know, leads to burnout, it leads to compromisation of quality, and if I'm worried about that kind of things, I might need to start off another project to actually rectify it, and it can become a self-defeating cycle. Anyone resonate with any of that? Yeah, there's a little bit of me in that, out of interest. So maybe... 15%, 20%, okay, all right, interesting. Again, it's not good, it's not bad, it's both. It's interesting, all right? There's advantages to it, there are downsides to it. Okay, the next one, please me. Uh, you might also hear this as a people pleaser driver, but transactional analysis calls it a please me driver. So some symptoms here, you're asking a lot of questions, you're checking with every everybody, is that all right? Is that okay? Are you all right with this? You know, are we going in the right direction? What do you think? Right. Even if you don't need to. Even if they are not in any way an authority or a senior figure, you really don't like the idea of people being upset with something you've decided or, or want to do. So this please me driver will force you to do that. Any concept of conflict, any prospect of people arguing, not just with yourself, but with each other, stresses you. Because we want harmony. We like things to be nice and calm. And again, that's a good thing in many situations. But sometimes, I'm sure you found, we need a little bit of conflict. We need a little bit of conflict. So please me, people will try and avoid that. They will really sticklers for the rules because of fear of judgment, fear of consequences of breaking the rules. So they'll stick within those boxes, especially the regulators. You can't upset the regulator. Or management, or seniority. Please, people, if everyone's happy, I'm okay, is the general script there. And as a result, I find it hard to say no to people. And actually, the other, it goes even further than that. We'll actually start rescuing people, even whether they've asked for help or not. So we will we'll see someone who's struggling, and that's not good. There's an imbalance in our personal force. We must rectify it. So we will go and help people taking on more stuff, and as a result, pushing what we need and what we want much further down the list of priorities. Uh, if anybody were to offer you any criticism, wow, that hurts. Because we're taking that as a personal judgment. They do, it's not a criticism of the idea, it's a criticism of us. Right? And our relationship and our perception and as our goodness as a human being, we internalize it that way. Anybody ignores us, or we think people are ignoring us. It's really, really stressful. We take it as a sign that they don't like us. And if someone doesn't like us, that is a bad thing. Again, not good, not bad. It's interesting. 
two, talked about sacrificing our priorities. Uh, the interesting one here is even most people make decisions based on emotion and then they find the rationale to back up their emotional decisions. This is even more the case for people pleasers. They put an emotional outcome over the logical outcome. So if I know this is a good thing, but people will be upset by it, this isn't as good thing, but people will be less upset, I'm going to go for this one. Right? That kind of thinking. So how does that affect you as product owners potentially? Well, you are going to be receiving a heck of a lot of feedback, aren't you? Right? And if you can't separate the feedback on the idea or the product or the feature from yourself, that's, that's going to really eat away at your resilience. That's going to be really chipping away at your self-confidence um, and just your general enjoyment and resilience. But equally, you need to give feedback to other people, whether that be the dev team, whether that be the stakeholders. And if you're worried about them getting upset, if you're worried about them not liking you, you're going to water down that feedback and the product will suffer. Your job as a product person isn't to make friends, to make great products. Right? The prioritization becomes very difficult. You've got person A who wants something, person B who wants something. They're both nice people. I want them to both be happy. Can't we do both? But then the dev team are saying they're not happy because they're over. Oh, my word, what am I going to do? All right, so prioritization gets really, really tough because we, we take that as, well, I'm upsetting somebody. Um, now, I, pr I probably need to change this analogy, but I've written about it, and I was told once that a camel was a horse designed by a committee. Now, I think that's quite harsh on camels because actually they're pretty well designed for their environments. But the, the theory was nobody wanted a camel. They just had lots of different requirements, and someone put them all together and ended up with a camel. So the analogy I don't think really works anymore. But that idea of if you try to please everybody, you will end up with a product that pleases nobody is a big risk for a product person. And that please me driver can be a big underminer for that. And so what's going on for us? Again, if this gets out of control, too much work in progress, we say yes to too many people, yes to too many projects, yes to too many things, we can become overburdened and our priorities, our needs can suffer, we get burnout. Oh, so anyone put their hand up for that one? You know, now I'm not going to pick on you. I'm not going to talk to you. Don't worry. Yeah, okay. So it's not as many as the, as, um, as the first one. That's fine. That's interesting. It's interesting how, uh, how this works. Be perfect. Quite a big one for a product, pe product people. So you find yourself setting some high standards of yourself and other people. And again... That's a good thing. Right? You don't want to settle for mediocre. No one really wants to buy a mediocre product, a meh product, do they? Right? But sometimes these high standards can get out of control. As opposed to the please me driver, perfection people, perfectionists tend to be overly logical. They don't really let emotion come in at all, in many ways. Very, very logical thinkers. If you find yourself using precise language, now that doesn't just need to be exactly, they say things like exactly, precisely or correctly using the word literally one of my pet peeves um, but also if you're not sure then you will be really certain to caveat it so you would use the word probably or possibly okay so if you're really precise about your language using really descriptive language that's an indicator that your be perfect driver is, is alive and kicking uh, as you can tell from me tidy appearance nice ironed shirt um, Clean shaven? Maybe not. So the be perfect driver might not be something that's, uh, that's, a, that's a big driver for me, but people who have that, that really nice, tidy... Again, it's a good thing to be nice, clean, tidy, right? But it can get out of control. Uh, my father-in-law, bless him, classic, he used to actually have a perfect list. And if someone made a mistake, they were off the perfect list. Uh, and he used to say, if it's, if it's not a right angle, it's a wrong angle. Yeah, it's got to be laid out exactly so. Um, you might have other words for that, um, but in the context of this, we'll call it a be perfect driver, all right? And it served him well, but it can be quite demanding for other people. It can be quite intimidating for other people. Generally speaking, if you don't, if you find yourself unwilling or feeling a little bit anxious about the idea of giving up control to somebody else, again, this be perfect driver might be coming because nobody can do it as well as you. You can't be certain that they will actually have the conscientiousness that you have. 
why would I let somebody else do this if they're not going to do it? I might as well just do it myself. Right? And that actually is a big thing. You find yourself, oh, I'll just take on everything myself. I find it very difficult to hand off, to delegate. Because, well, I might as well just do it perfect. Because nobody else has good standards these days. You find yourself saying something like that. What's wrong with people? So, I get very irritated. How does this work as a product owner, product person? Well, it actually affects your ability to innovate. Because it's very difficult to innovate perfectly. Innovation actually involves letting go of what you know um, and opening yourself up to imperfection. And actually, the result of innovation usually is an unintended result. So you've got to open yourself up to that. If you take control, take too much control, filter out other people's views and contributions, and actually reduce the ability to make mistakes, you just stay where you are. Again, might not be a bad thing, but in some circumstances it could be familiar with gold plating and overdoing things, your time to market reduces because you try and do things perfectly before you release it to the opposite of the hurry up driver. We're going to take too long to get to market rather than get there too quickly. And actually find yourself, you might find yourself as a product owner, actually not really enjoying the journey, as they say. And the life cycle of a product, even though it's a lot shorter than it used to be, still takes up a lot of your time. So if you're thinking, well, I'm, I will be happy when our product is perfect. And yet this might not be an explicit conscious thing. You're condemning yourself to a long time of not being happy. All right? And that's quite, that's quite a challenge for resilience and burnout, like I said. And all of this stuff is going on underneath the surface. Other people don't see your high standards as high standards. They see them as being very, very picky. And annoying, annoyingly detailed. Does it really matter? Does it really matter if that font is 12.5 instead of 12? Burnout, you can be seen as a slave driver. Uh, and quite often you'll find yourself, well, yeah, yeah, I can see that's a good thing, but it could be better. Right. And it's all with good intentions. The intentions there are to give a better experience for your customers and users to have a better reputation as a product, to, to be more successful. But it can have downsides. Anybody associate with, with, with any of those? More. More. We're increasing. It's not intentional. Okay, be strong. Be strong. A be strong driver. If you find yourself faced with ambiguity, faced with uncertainty, Faced with quiet, you will generally say, okay, I'll do it. If there's a difficult situation, rather than let somebody else struggle on, you will put that on your back and carry on. Plow forward. You do your cliff shuffle. All right? um, it's a good thing in a crisis because generally you don't get ruffled. Because the success driver for you is, I can be strong. I can work through this. And other people will see you as really, really calm which actually leads them to think, well, if I stay quiet long enough, Jeff will step up and take this on, which increases my ability to do that. All right? So other people are enabling me. And asking for help, generally seen as a, I failed. I should be able to do this on my own. That should, should, should. And we're assuming that other people see it as a weakness as well. And that transfers to them. So other people don't like asking for help because they know that we see asking for help as a weakness. Emotion is seen as a weakness for people with a be strong driver. You should boil this down to being logical. Emotions are not logic. All right? They get in the way. Uh, so because of that, very difficult to build relationships with people. We can't understand why their emotions are coming into play. We don't show our emotions, so they find it very difficult to connect to us. Um, and we don't really give people the chance to learn and grow. When we see anybody struggling, we will come in and say, come on, let's do this, I'll help, I'll get you through this, which again, has good intentions, but reduces that person's growth and agency and autonomy as well. And when things get tough, because we don't really have the ability to, to, to use our emotions because that's a sign of weakness, generally we just go quiet. So if you find yourself faced with a disappointment, or a conflict that you don't know how to resolve, there's no logical solution to it, 
empathy isn't necessarily your way out of it. Logic isn't your way out of it. So, okay, I'm just going to leave this one and see what happens. See if you can sort it out yourselves, right? Because I don't like this. Who is that useful to you as a product owner to be aware of? Well, feedback, all right? If, uh, if, we're, if we are unable to build rapport, if, uh, if we see something coming up, we take it very, this is a problem for me to solve. Generally, I, I'll encourage people to assess the credibility of the witness when receiving feedback, because not all feedback is truth. Yeah, feedback is just a perception, it's an opinion. But people with a, with a B strong driver take feedback as a, okay, well, this is something I need to do. This is a problem for me to solve. This is a mountain for me to climb. And they will just get on with it. Uh, so, again, we can have on too much work in progress. This, this lack of psychological safety, which is, which is a big term, quite rightly so, at the moment. If, if we aren't showing emotion, if we aren't willing to ask for help, then other people are less likely to be willing to ask for help. So there's, there's just this sense of, oh, we just need to tough it out. Right? We need to work on through this. I should be able to do this. So there's poor rapport with your development team, with your stakeholders, with your users. We need to understand people. We need to understand where they're coming from. And actually, might not be too much of, of an issue for you, but it'd be interesting if it does. Um, when we see something that shouldn't be the case, right? something that, say, poor working conditions here, it could be you know, working late, an, expe an expectation of just overtime or um, you know, low breaks or whatever it may be. We would tough it out because that's our driver. But we also then expect other people to do it. So we don't call it. And if we're in a position of leadership, leadership is often cited as the poor behavior that you're willing to tolerate. That is an accepted way of working because you're tolerating it. It just seems normal to you um, because you can cope with it. So too much work in progress, you bottle things up, and obviously at some point will explode. Uh, and actually an interesting one here, because we're very good in a crisis, unconsciously, we can actually find ourselves manufacturing crises because that plays to our strength. Right? We don't do it deliberately. We don't go out to sabotage things. But actually, at some level, we like being able to, to take control of a crisis. So we create it. We, there's this phrase, if you, if, you, if, you, um, if you reward the firefighters, you breed arsonists. That kind of thing. And that's an internal thing as well as an organizational thing. And our final drive, oh, who, who, who resonates with the Be Strong driver? Smaller proportion uh, for those of you that are online. Not surprising. Um, it's, uh, it's probably the, 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 the fourth or the fifth one. Try hard is our fifth one. So this has some overlap with, in my opinion, has some overlap with, with the previous one. But this is, re this is really symptomatic of, I've got lots to do. My calendar is very, very full. I'm always busy. You're actually telling people how busy you are. You're telling people how things are really, really hard. Because actually you want people to realize how hard you are working, how hard you are trying. Right? That's how you get your gratification. That's how you know internally you're doing a good job. Because if your calendar wasn't very busy, if things weren't very full, then what's the point? What's, your, what's the point of you? Um, when something happens, the first reaction is it's something else's fault. It could be someone else's fault. It could be an external factor. It could be luck. It could be fate. We generally push off blame and accountability outside of ourselves if you find that happening we, we can rationalize it but your instinctive thought is it's not my it's not my fault and for us as long as we're doing our best that's okay now this is where i kind of have an interesting challenge here because that's kind of some of the messages that that i've been brought up with to a degree is you know as long as you're doing your best what else could you ask for but it can become, at some level, an excuse for missing your outcomes. And are we really doing our best? This is the question. And we're looking at output over outcome. So on the flip side of that, actually, a lot of what we say now is, it doesn't matter how hard you work if you get the outcomes. Well, that could be taken as, it doesn't matter if you work 60 hours a week as long as you get the outcome. So there's this really difficult balance to be struck here. And I think this is something that, that, that a lot of people in organizations don't really have that conversation about. Uh, there's a lot of unspoken stuff here. And because we take our effort levels really seriously, if we see other people 
that look like they're slacking off, that stresses us because that's not fair. Okay, at some level, that's not fair. Uh, does this phrase flog a dead horse mean anything? Over, yeah? Put it in mind. Not all of, uh, not all of the idioms and analogies that I use translate very well, but I thought this one might. This idea that you know, just keep whipping the dead horse just because, well, that's what we do. Hopefully it'll come back to life. It won't. All right? But this idea, well, if I keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I'm okay. All right? I've almost got myself covered. doesn't matter whether the horse is going to walk in. I'm doing what I'm... The horse, it's the horse's fault. Okay? Not mine. So how does that relate to you as a product person? Potentially, this can be seen as really, really intimidating. This, you've got to keep trying. You've got to give 100%, 100, 110%, whatever that is. 100% all the time. Keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. Which, on the one hand, can be effort. You know, some things are outside your control. I understand that. As long as you're trying your best. You know, we'll have a retrospective about it. Um, but this, um, it can be... It can encourage the wrong kind of behaviours. It can also lead to you getting overly attached to your ideas. So I've got this idea, I've tried something, hasn't quite worked, but if I try harder, it might. Rather than reading the signs that actually, no matter how much more I whip this horse, it ain't going to walk, I will hang on to that because I'm overly attached to it and I know if, if I worked harder, it would be okay. You probably notice some failed sprints. Now, by failed, I mean... The operation was a success, but the patient died. Yeah. So we've got some stuff, but actually we haven't got value because we're focused on effort rather than outcome. We could actually achieve the goal through less work, or we could work harder and meet the, not meet the goal. A try-hard person would choose the latter. And because of that, it can lead to a significant loss of faith. If we've got a loss a lot of failed sprints, and it doesn't even need to be that many for it to be a lot, then other people are going to start to lose faith that we know what we're doing. Uh, often we might, uh, the budgeting and the financial support might be tied to outcomes, and actually we're focused on output. Uh, again, not consciously, unconsciously, and burnout. So what can you do? Well, meditate. Um, no, seriously though, just become more aware of what's going on in your head. As busy people who have 544 miles to run without any sleep, it's very difficult to take time and actually think what's going on in my head here. What's driving my decisions? What's driving my behaviours? I'm feeling stressed about this. Why am I feeling stressed about this? What's driving that stress? What's driving my response? What options do I have? Could I be more mindful about my decisions? Not just for me, but for other people. So you can start becoming more aware of where your drivers are. Don't judge yourself on them, okay? Because, bad Jeff, be perfect again. No, that doesn't help. All that does is subconsciously tries to stop me from becoming aware of it because I know I'm just going to get metaphorically hit over the head again. Right? So you've got to allow yourself to see this stuff, not judge yourself for it, and think, okay, this is interesting. This is really interesting. I'm really impatient right now. What's going on about that? Is, that? is that a good thing? Is that necessary because of, you know, we've got time to market challenges? Or is this just me remembering that I've got to get my shoes on and do my teeth and brush my hair before, we, before five to eight so that we get to school on time? Is that, is that what this is? You know? And if I can accept that, then maybe I can make a different decision. I can change my action if I want to. Uh, and it's not about finding out that I'm doing something wrong necessarily. Sometimes just becoming aware of it. Oh, this is good actually. And we don't do that enough either. We don't give ourselves enough credit for the good things that we do as product people because there's so much going on. Yeah, actually, no, I, I did put a lot of effort into that. That, is a, that was appropriate. That was a good thing. Other people stepped up and they role modeled and so on. And being a role model is a big part of being a product person, in my opinion. You have a position of leadership. Even if you don't have as much authority and power and status as you would like, you do have a lot of respect. You do have a position of leadership. Um, and one tool that I'll, I'll encourage you to just experiment with is just questioning your assumptions. Okay, so if I reduced my standards by 10% because my be perfect driver might be a little bit out of control, what do I think will happen? What am I assuming will happen? 
list them out. List out those assumptions. And then evaluate them. Evaluate how likely those assumptions are to become real. When you see them written down on paper, are they statistically, probability-wise, likely to happen? Or are they, eh, might happen, but more likely they won't? Is there something that you could do to reduce the risk of it? To, all right, it might happen, maybe there's a 50% chance of it happening. Is there anything that you could do to take that down to 40% or 30%, but something in place to mitigate that risk? Is there something that you could put in place, if it does happen, that would allow you to recover from it? A backup plan? A rollback plan might make it a little bit easier to just temper that be perfect driver or that hurry up driver. How often have you heard something as a drop dead deadline, but after the deadline, nothing dropped dead? Question the assumptions behind it. And then maybe if you get really good at this, you can start thinking about, well, if this risk that I've got in my head actually does happen, how could that be a good thing? Not just for me, but for everybody else. If we actually, if we actually deliver something imperfect, how could that be a good thing? If we actually didn't try quite so hard and people took advantage of that and maybe had a Friday afternoon off or something like that, how could that be a good thing? What are we worried about and actually, could we flip that? Could we reframe it? And this is um, a tweak from a TED Talk by a guy called Tim Ferriss. If you want to watch the TED Talk, it's called Fear Setting. There are trigger warnings associated with it, so be careful. But generally looking at the fears that we have, how could you list them out? So I, I, I tweaked it slightly. So risks, reductions, recoveries. And reframings. I nearly began with R. All right, just a reminder the only person you can really affect is yourself. We put a lot of effort into changing other people, changing our stakeholders' opinions, changing our users' opinions, changing our leaders' opinions, getting more support, changing our development teams. But really, the only person we can have any kind of impact on is ourselves. So channel your energy into that. Um, you're going to have more time with yourself than any of those people as well. Um, and just think. You know, what do other people think of me? How do they see me? Maybe it's take some time out. And there's, there's a, there's a, there might be a gap between how you see yourself and how other people see you. Is that worth acting on? Would you be happier, more resilient, less likely to burn out, more successful, be able to make more mindful decisions on behalf of the product if you were more in control of what's going on in here? And then just keep track. Literally, just have a little tally chart. Oh, okay. Well, I was quite impatient today. And somebody said we might have to put, the, put back the date. That really got me going in here. I'm going to stick another one in the chart here. And just notice it. Don't judge it. Don't beat yourself up with the head of it. But just, just notice it. And just by noticing it, you might actually see a little bit more mindfulness crop in. Uh, if you are interested in, in reading up more on transactional analysis or people-pleasing or anything like that. There are a few good books out there, um, and there's, there's a link to Tim Ferriss's initial uh, fear-setting talk in there as well. For me, I think this is a big part of being a product person, is knowing yourself. There's the, there's the mechanical side to being a product person. There's your roadmaps, there's your backlogs, there's your priorities. But really, a lot of those reactions and a lot of the decisions you make are driven by what's going on in here. And some of it can be really, really helpful. Some of it, when out of control, can be less than helpful. My, my role is to try and help people understand themselves better, manage themselves better, and then the product stuff will take care of itself. I'm here the rest of the day. Some of my colleagues will be downstairs, happy to talk through any of this stuff and yeah, how you can support yourself as a product person or support your colleagues. Happy to talk, but we've got time for a couple of questions. Time for a couple of questions, folks. Um, so just for anyone who's online, um, if you could just add your question into the platform. I know we have a question uh, through Alison. Alison is going to read out the questions and we'll have time for one or two in person as well. So um, maybe let's start with the online question, if that's okay. I think, Alison, you've got the, you've got the mic there. Perfect. So, Jeff, 
how do we balance when we have folks on our team who work long hours because they enjoy it, but it puts others on the team behind trying to keep up with them? Mm. So there's, we don't want people, and I, and I get this, and I was talking to somebody yesterday about um, their, I can't remember, they didn't use the term hero, but they, they're basically one of their, their, their better developers is leaving because development is basically what they, they finish work and they go home and they do more development. That's their hobby as well as their life, their, their work. Um, and I think that's, that's that, personally, I think that's fine because for them that's sustainable. It's one of those things, if you're doing something you love, it's not really a job type thing. But being aware of the impact that it has on other people is key. So I'm, I'm going to assume through my own experience of something similar, that that conversation hasn't really be, been had within that team. There's this almost implicit assumption of, okay, well, am I going to be judged differently because I'm not doing what they're doing? Right. Well, am I adding, adding value in a different way? So having conversations about that, I think, is, is really, really important. And having a conversation with that person in terms of the implications they might be having on the rest of the team, because they are a team member. They have a responsibility to their teammates as well as themselves. So I would, I would, as with all of the stuff that I've talked about today, there are positives to all of it. There's positives to the be perfect driver and, and, and try hard and all this kind of stuff. But if we do it too much, then actually we lose the benefits and we tip into dysfunction. So trying, the goal really, is not to get rid of your be perfect driver, it's to harness the positives of it without letting the negatives come in. Not just for you, but for other people. So I, I like the fact that the question was about team members because I know it might not seem like it at times, but they're human beings as well. All right? It's not just product people that have these drivers. All human beings do. And having those conversations about, well, what motivates us? What, what, what situations stress us? How can we take advantage of that as individuals and as a team without letting the shadow of it creep in to the rest of the team. So have a conversation, is the short answer, Alison. Okay. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Can you raise a hand, please, if you have a question? Did we bring a tumbleweed? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, Jeff, thanks so much for a great talk. That was really enlightening. Um, I thought it was really interesting because it actually talked through a number of uh, traits that I think are really prevalent in product people. I had my hand up for the whole thing. Uh, but I mean, I'm not sure if other people are aware, but a lot of those traits are super common in people with ADHD and autism as well. Hand up. Um, so I wasn't sure if uh, you were aware that it was like, you know, something that uh, product people should be aware of in terms of, you know, something we talk about in terms of neurodiversity in the product sphere. I was thinking on the way in, what would be one of the hardest questions people could ask me? <laughs> <laughs> and it would be around that because, um, I, I, because I'm not um, as clued up on that as I would like to be. And that was brought to my attention uh, last week, actually, so I was working with somebody who, uh, who's dyslexic and he was talking to me about how, how we had this after, after workshop event, social event, and he said, I can't come on that. It's not because I don't want to be social, it's because I actually need to go through what we went through today and repackage it up because otherwise I won't be able to access that information later on. I so said, I wasn't aware of that. He said, do you design your workshops for people with you know, neurodiversity in mind, I said, well, I did go through a phase of trying and then I've just got a bit lazy on that and that's on me. So I don't understand it as much as I, as I would like, but yeah, you can look at some of this stuff and I, I make the joke that you know, my, my father-in-law, if it's not a right angle, it's a wrong angle and you know, he, he lines his shoes up perfectly by the door. And that, that could be a sign of somewhere along the autism spectrum, um, ADHD maybe. And I, the reason I did, was worried about being asked the question is because I don't have the academic rigor to the answer but I, in my head it's somewhere along that and it's probably more of a of a challenge and more important to have the conversation for people who have that as more of a part of their life but thank you okay 
Thanks, Jana. Um, so just in the interest of time, we'll, we'll move on. Um, if anyone has any questions for Jeff, you can catch him during the break as well. Yep. And um, if people want to contact you online, uh, how, can they, how can they find you online? Um, just Google Jeff Watts and ignore the book about irritable bowel syndrome, because that's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Different, so, different Jeff Watts. Different Jeff Watts. He's our, he's our keynote next year, yeah. that other Jeff Watts. So. Um, thanks very much, Jeff. Excellent talk. Cheers.